Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin grew up in poor, war-ravaged Leningrad, a city that lost 800,000 people at the hands of a relentless Nazi siege. It was a tough life for a boy living in a multi-family apartment co-op where chasing rats was a favorite pastime, and he became angry and constantly got into fights. In the sixth grade, he found an outlet for his aggression in Sambo, a Russian martial art. He also had dreams of becoming a spy, a hope that was realized when he eventually joined the KGB, which in those days was the world's largest spy organization. Putin was assigned to Dresden, Germany in 1985 to gather intelligence on the West. This time in East Germany was spent recruiting agents and slowly climbing the KGB's ladders. He also developed a love for material objects like stereos, which he would get smuggled to him from the Westerners he was in contact with. At the same time, more broadly, the USSR, a big oil exporter, was making billions from its energy sales abroad. The KGB was entrusted with the task of managing and reinvesting all the money. So when the Soviet Union was in its final days, high-level KGB officers took advantage of their positions of access to hide these billions in banks and other investment sources all over the world where only they could find and have access to the funds. And then, when the Soviet Union was completely dissolved, they turned around and stole a lot of this money to make themselves incredibly rich. Although it's unclear exactly how involved Putin was in this theft, it does reveal the morally bankrupt culture that dominated the upper echelons of the KGB at a time when Putin was rising within its ranks. After the fall of the Soviet Union, Putin returned to his home city, Leningrad, now called St. Petersburg, where he became deputy mayor in charge of all foreign economic relations, a linchpin at a time when that economic window was finally opening. This sudden embrace of capitalism in Russia allowed for a wild, wild west-like culture to take root throughout the country, where criminal organizations thrived and a tribute system built on widespread bribery was established. According to the book Putin's Kleptocracy, Putin's St. Petersburg days underline this style of work, building overlapping networks of people in which he is at the center, relying on them to promote privatization while supporting the state, and assisting each other in personal gain. Putin occupied one position after another that regulated and controlled the privatization process, becoming indispensable in legalizing what otherwise would have been illicit activities. It was in St. Petersburg where Putin learned and honed the art of robbing the government under the cover of investing on behalf of the government. The list of his shady involvements is long, but the highlights are seizing control of the legalized casino gambling industry, controlling the city's food delivery system, and the founding of the Petersburg Fuel Company, which is where he likely developed the skills he would later use to control Russia's all-important energy sector. During this time, Putin also founded Bank Rossiya and used it and a real estate holding company to launder the large amounts of money he and his partners were skimming off of each transaction for themselves. His thefts were so brazen that the St. Petersburg legislature censured him, recommending that he be removed from office and criminally prosecuted. But Putin's boss, Mayor Subchuk, did the opposite thing and promoted him. When Mayor Subchuk lost re-election in 1996, Putin came to Moscow, where his ascension rapidly accelerated. He took a job in the presidential administration, where he was responsible for organizing the transfer of all the former foreign assets of the Soviet Union and Communist Party to the newly formed Russian Federation. His work obviously impressed President Yeltsin, and after less than a year, he became deputy head of the presidential administration and simultaneously head of the GKU the office responsible for, according to Putin's kleptocracy, overseeing the implementation of federal laws, executive orders, and presidential instructions. During this period, he learned how to use the power of the executive branch to cover up illegal activity and scandals. This included helping his old boss, Mayor Subchuk, escape the country when Subchuk became the target of a criminal investigation. After a year in this powerful post, President Yeltsin promoted Putin again giving him responsibility over the regions of Russia, a position he used to reassert central governmental control. According to Putin's own biography, quote, 
To this day, I think that was the most interesting job. I developed relationships with many of the governors at that time. It was clear to me that work with the regional leaders was one of the most important lines of work in the country. Everyone was saying that the vertical, the vertical chain of government, had been destroyed and that it had to be restored. He conceded that not all the governors agreed with this approach, but you can't please everybody. Putin then became head of the Federal Security Service, the main security agency of Russia and the successor agency to his beloved KGB. Think of the FSB as the FBI, NSA, Border Patrol, Coast Guard, and DEA combined. This incredibly powerful job was the culmination of his decade-long education in the various levels and levers of governmental power. Putin had developed almost every possible skill someone would need to rule Russia, and when he was made Prime Minister in 1999, his education was complete. He now knew how to control the parliament who made the Federation's laws. Thanks for watching part two of our mini documentary Putin's Russia. Click on the screen to watch the next part in the series, or to visit the full series playlist, or a playlist of all of our more than 40 videos covering Vladimir Putin and the Ukrainian conflict, or our latest video. And if you want to go a lot deeper down into this rabbit hole, click below to sign up for a free month of audible.com and receive a free audiobook download like Putin's Kleptocracy by Karen DeWisha, the book that heavily influenced this series. For signing up, a small contribution will be made by Audible on your behalf to support this channel and our continued work on mini-documentaries like this one.